I'm going to talk to you guys about getting started about blogging with a blogging platform called Jekyll. Now, Jekyll is, er, um, my name is Eric Lathrop. I work with Cafe Press as a senior software engineer. And you can find me on Twitter at Eric Lathrop. Uh, and I have a Jekyll blog. Now, what is Jekyll? Jekyll is a static website generator um, that is simple and blog aware. Um, being a static website generator means it generates just plain HTML, it doesn't run any server side code, and it just spits out files that run on any web server. It runs on your laptop or your workstation and pushes files up to the server. It's simple, meaning there's not a lot of setup, there's no database to set up, there's, you just uh, have Ruby and Jekyll and you run it and you're done. It's, it's pretty straightforward if you already know HTML or CSS. Jekyll basically glues a couple of common things together. Um, if you have a, it makes you write templates in a templating language called Liquid and it runs them through a markdown processor to take markdown files, convert them to HTML and then mash all the HTML together as liquid templates and it produces a static website for you. How that compares to something like WordPress um, is you do all the work on your laptop and you do it once and then you upload all those files to the server and you're done. You don't, there's no dynamic code to run on the server so um, whereas WordPress runs a bunch of PHP code on the server and you have a database and you have um, themes and plugins and software you have to keep updated. Um, and every time someone makes a web request, they go and they run all of this PHP code on your server and it might not scale well. Um, or static files, they, they're as, best, as good as you can go. <laughs> um, so with something like Jekyll, you can, since they're static files, you can put them on any web server. It'll work. Um, any web server can serve static files. Um, you don't have to worry about any security problems because there's no extra software running and there's nothing ever to update on the server besides your OS and it's super fast. Um, the hard, or one of the cons of running Jekyll is things like comments or dynamic things are really hard. You can do it, <laughs> but it's really hard. There's a, you can do comments with like Discuss, which is like a JavaScript commenting platform and there's lots of other things you can do. Um, so to install Jekyll, it's, if you it's basically two steps. You install Ruby, um, which is easy enough if you go to ruby-lang.org, and then you use a Ruby gem command to install Jekyll. You just gem install Jekyll and you're done. If you're a programmer and you do a lot with Ruby, um, you might want to set up RVM and Bundler and all that, and you can um, put, put it all in a Git repo and be ready to go. Um, but the easy way, if you're not a real technical person or a programmer, you can just install Ruby and gem install Jekyll, and then you have the Jekyll command and you're good to go. Um, once you have Jekyll installed, you open up the command line and you run Jekyll new and then the name of your website, and it generates a whole folder with a little template website, just an index page and one post, so you can go in there and start messing around with it. It's really nice. It just came out maybe a week ago um, with their 1.0 release. Um, you can go into the folder and you run a command called Jekyll serve and that starts up a local web server and you can start um, playing around and looking at the site and editing it live on your laptop without hooking up to the internet or anything. Um, now when you run Jekyll new, it creates a bunch of files for you, like a static website. Um, if you look at them, the ones on the left are the, the actual templates in the plain data and the ones on the left is when Jekyll builds the site, it puts everything in underscore site folder. And that's all the mashed together output that you want to put on your server. Um, there's a under, all the underscore folders, or anything starting with an underscore is like a Jekyll sort of uh, built in thing that's not going to get pushed to live. It's sort of, that's how it, all of its configuration, like the underscore post is where you put all of your markdown files for all of your blog entries. Um, the layout, underscore layouts, is all of the you know, the layouts that wrap around the, um, the posts, like the common header and footer and everything. 
um, and they get some default CSS and uh, index page. So this is the first post that it creates when you do Jekyll new. Um, it just tells you a little bit about Jekyll, but you can see it's got a header up here in the bottom. It's got a footer with links to your GitHub and Twitter and stuff. Um, this is the beginning of the dot markdown file for that post that it generates that gets converted into that web page. You can see it's missing the header and the footer. Um, and at the very top, this yellow section is the, um, it's what's called the YAML front matter. It's a sort of YAML configuration section where you can set variables and stuff that you can use in other parts of the site with the liquid templating language. Um, things like there's the title, which layout to use to wrap this post in. So you can have different layouts and wrap different pages in different layouts um, in the time it was published and all of that. Now the things here highlighted in purple are markdown syntax pieces, like the back ticks are highlight this as code. Um, th this is a little bit of a quick reference here on markdown. You can, it's basically a plain text language for marking up text. You can put stars around text to make it italic and bold, and you can put um, space star space and do, and it'll create bulleted lists for you. And it makes it a lot easier than having to edit a bunch of HTML tags. <laughs> and uh, just really straightforward. People, places like Stack Overflow and GitHub use it a lot. Um, now that post, it used a layout and in the called uh, post, and in the layouts folder, there's a post.html, and this is what it gets wrapped in. You can see the content thing in purple at the bottom. The that's where whatever called this layout goes. So the post goes in that bracket bracket content, and the double um, curly braces are mar or are the liquid template code items. So there's the page title. It, oh, it puts an H2 on every single page that uses that layout. Um, and you can see it with the, the layout itself has a YAML front matter section at the top. So layouts can use other layouts and you can nest them so you can reuse a lot. Like you can have just a plain HTML5 skeleton that doesn't have anything specific to a site. And then you can have an, another layout that has your, your content divs or whatever in there. Um, and this is the, the default layout that it uses. It's just an HTML skeleton or whatever. It, call, it has the header and the footer and um, all the CSS links and everything. So the, uh, besides posts, the, the common thing on blogs is the index page that lists every single blog post. The, this is the built-in one that comes with Jekyll new. Um, it just shows the one post, and it's just got a link in the date that each post was on. And this is the, the HTML file for it, slash index.html, it's got some liquid code in there, but no markdown, it's just a, it's a .html file. Um, it uses the default layout, and in the purple brackets, there's a for loop that loops through every single post. This is the, the blog aware part of Jekyll. <laughs> they can, you, you've got this posts object that has all of the posts on the website. And so it basically has a list, and for every single post, it does a list item. If you want to change that, like you don't usually just want the list of the links to all your posts, you usually want like the first paragraph or something like that. They've got something built in. You can add this section in white here, this post.excerpt, and that'll put the first paragraph of your blog post right in there. And that's how it changes. It adds this the first paragraph right there. So if you wanted to take that further, you can take that same um, concept with the index page, and you can use that to generate an RSS feed. Jekyll isn't necessarily um, forcing you to use HTML for everything. You can generate XML or whatever. It just runs these text files through Liquid and generates output. So you can put XML in there, and there's the same for loop. There's a, the layout none at the top, which tells it don't use any layout at all. Just spit out plain um, XML without wrapping it in anything. And you can see all the regular XML in green for RSS feed. And every time you build your Jekyll site, it populates that with all the posts. And people who subscribe to your site can read it. This is uh, Firefox showing you the Jekyll site, or the RSS feed, so it's a valid RSS feed. 
Jekyll has a bunch of plugins. You can edit all the pre-processing or whatever on your computer. You can make it so it'll take YouTube IDs and generate the embed code for you so you don't have to do that. They're kind of like WordPress short codes. Um, there's, you can do the less and SAS pre-processing into CSS or the coffee script or the minification or anything like that with, through plugins. Um, so there's a lot of them out there and they're just plain Ruby and you drop them in an underscore plugins folder on your computer and when you run Jekyll it spits them out. So when you're working on your laptop editing your Jekyll site, you're going to run Jekyll serve dash dash watch, which tells it to watch all of the files for any changes. So you can run that in another terminal and every time you make a change, it'll you can refresh your browser and you'll see the change immediately. It'll re reprocess those files, spit them all out in the site folder. Um, and then when you want to deploy, you want to run Jekyll build, which does like one process. It just processes all the files once, puts them in the site folder, and then use rsync or whatever to deploy them to your production site. Um, yeah. So hosting, you can host, like I said earlier, you can host a Jekyll site on anything because it's just static files. Um, I've, I'm hosting them on a you know, shared web host that I've been paying for for years, and it runs PHP, and I actually included .htx as files in there to do the, you know, the custom 404 handling, to reroute it to my 404 page, um, things like that. Um, GitHub is the, the place that created Jekyll, and they have this, this GitHub pages that allows, it's meant for open source projects or whatever projects to host their web page, their documentation, that kind of thing and it's, it runs on Jekyll. And they've opened it up so you can host your website on GitHub pages for free. And if you know Git, it's super easy and it's really easy to set up. You can have a user page or a user website. If you make a, a repository named yourusername.github.io and upload it to GitHub, you can go to that username.github.io and see that Jekyll website. It'll process it. One of the catches of hosting uh, Jekyll site on GitHub pages is that they won't run the plugins. The only because that's arbitrary Ruby code, and they don't have to be a security issue. So they have you know one or two approved things that are in the core of Jekyll that they'll run, but most of the time it's just it's plain the vanilla Jekyll site. Um, you can also have per repository Jekyll sites on GitHub pages if you have a branch, you have to make an orphan branch that's not connected to the, the rest of the source code called gh-pages, and you can also view that at your username.github.io slash the repository name. Now, that's kind of cool, but even cooler is that they have support for adding a custom domain name, like you have, I have ericlathrop.com or whatever, I could point that at GitHub pages. You can, you put a text file at the top level of your Jekyll site, called CNAME, and you say this is what the real name, the domain name that this web page is, and you call it ericlathrop.com or whatever, and you upload that to, uh, to GitHub pages, and what they'll do is if anyone goes to the github.io page anymore, it'll actually redirect you them to the real domain name that you want people to see. And then you just change your DNS, you have, if you have a ericlathrop.com with no www, no subdomains, um, you just set a DNS A record and point it to the GitHub pages server and it works. If you want www or any other subdomains to work, you CNAME those to your username.github.io DNS name and th those will also be redirected and they'll work fine. Um, they also support 404 pages. If you have a file at the top level called 404.html, it will redirect any missing page there. So instead of seeing the GitHub page, so then no one will even have to know that you're running off GitHub. Um, and it's free hosting and it's really fast. Um, so you don't have to just build blogs with Jekyll. Like it has blog support, but you can put anything in the Jekyll folder and it'll pre-process it and stick it in the underscore site folder. If there's no, um, if it doesn't have this 
YAML front matter section here at the top in yellow. If it doesn't have that, it won't touch it. It'll just pass it on through and copy it over. If it has it, it'll process it with, depending on the file extension, if it's a .md, it'll process it with markdown. If it's a dot, I forget what the textile extension is, you can process it with textile instead, or you can use a different markdown processor if you don't like the one it comes with. Um, and if you just have other files, it will just use the Jekyll, or the liquid markup to run the liquid code. You can put variables in there, and you can do include, so it's, it makes making a static HTML website really easy. Like if you're a, a front-end designer and you do a lot of stuff for like restaurants or whatever, that doesn't change very often, you don't have to learn a whole new system. You already know HTML. It takes 10 more minutes to learn Markdown and 10 more minutes to learn Liquid, and then you can generate static, you know, complex web pages without having to do anything. Um, So here's the, the Jekyll homepage and the GitHub pages homepage, and there's, this is the most common reference for Markdown. Um, there's this other thing called Octopress, which someone built a framework on top of Jekyll that has like a HTML or a semantic HTML5 templates built in, and I think it has maybe Twitter bootstrap in there already, and just some common things if you want to go that route, if you don't want to hand crank it. But it's great if you, it's really great if you just like messing around with HTML and you don't want to learn how to write a WordPress plugin or anything. Question? Yeah, no, it doesn't do that. That's um, you do that with like Twitter or Facebook has like JavaScript plugins or whatever, and that's just plain JavaScript that you put on your site that they give you in a on their developer pages. Yeah, it's it's all just HTML, so you can just paste that in there or whatever. You can you know you go, you go to YouTube and you click share or something, and they've got that embed, the iframe in there with the embedded YouTube code, and you can just paste that on your thing. One of the nice things about Markdown is it'll pass through HTML too, so you can write your Markdown code and write nice text, but if you want to embed like a YouTube URL, you just plop that HTML right in the middle of it, and it works. So it's really nice. Um, I like not having, I was running a WordPress blog for a couple of months and dealing with like comment spam and just, try, just trying to get it to look the way I wanted to and work the right way. You have to, there's so much to learn. It's like, I already know HTML. You know, I, I'm a web developer. I do that all day. Like it's 10 more minutes to learn this stuff and you're off and running. And it's, if you're, you're probably already keeping your stuff in GitHub, you just name the repository a certain way and they can do your hosting too. Like it's amazing. It's really cool. It makes me rethink about how a lot of websites are designed where you're doing all this processing every single page hit. You know, you're running your ASP page or your PHP page or whatever. You don't have to do that. Like most of the time these things are static. You just generate it once and it can sit there and be served for free, basically. So, any other questions? All right, thank you guys. <laughs>